Check, check, check. Can anyone hear me? What's up, big one today? Happy Friday, Fraser Friday. What's Welcome up, back, Todd. Good to Father. see everybody. Good How you doing, everybody? Not. Oh, I didn't want to see that guy. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just gonna say I liked your shirt, Todd. My bad. Never mind oh. then. Oh, preach, baby, preach. Thank you very <laughs> no, much. I ain't preaching nothing. Wait, what? You heard me say that? I said it. Oh. Can I guys? Can, can I ask you a question and let me know if I'm being a Debbie Downer here? Yes. So, do you know about the spring breakout games? They're they're playing the minor leaguers from each team against each other in exhibition games. So, for example, you get like the Orioles minor leaguers and the Blue Jays minor leaguers. I've, I'm not I've, saying I don't want it. I am a prospects draft, whatever you want to call it. Guy. I've always yeah. been like that. I've hosted drafts. I've hosted prospect shows, etc. Right. Yeah. What if we just did a futures game for Florida and a futures game for Arizona so we saw all the top prospects in one spot? That would definitely draw more eyeballs and to me would stand out more because right now, Kratz, if I watched Yankees Orioles, would I rather see Jackson Holiday playing with Gunnar Henderson and Austin Wells playing with Aaron Judge or the whole group of prospects together? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can watch minor leaguers during the season and i don't think there's a ton of appeal for certain people to watch you know the 19 year old a ball dude who's you know ranked 27th on a list with everyone else i i would rather if they're that good see them in a futures game style exhibition in florida or arizona i'm always gonna be a proponent for the the dudes that nobody hears of getting an opportunity because you have a shot at making the big leagues there's top 25 even the guys out of the top 25 have a shot at making the big leagues so for me i i'm i'm hemming and hauling depending on if you're being debbie downer or not to me i think it sells we sell this game regionally do we want it more nationally absolutely a futures game spring training game would be more of a national sale but we're regional the angels system sucks it doesn't mean the players in that system suck it means that they're just not as publicized. So to me, allow Angels fans to see them play against the Dodgers. I don't know what's going to happen. You just have an opportunity to get guys on a national stage that normally won't be seen. Are they going to be future All-Stars? No, but I think we cater too much to the one percenters, the Jackson Holidays, you know, the Gunnar Henderson, of the, the superstars in the game. I get it. That's what pumps the money but the game is played by 85% of other guys. And those guys, this is an opportunity to showcase that. And you know what? You got video of this dude hitting a dinger in this spring training showcase series when he gets called up in the middle of the season. And now you have more of a connection with a guy who's kind of a roster filler. You know what? You bring up a really good point. <clears throat> they do these things during the year, at least when I played, they do these things where after spring training is over, they bring – the top minor leaguers and go to their minor leagues. So I was with the Reds. Double A was in Zebulon, North Carolina. They bring the major league team there, and they play against the top prospects of the organization. And that I like that still because now the double A squad in North Carolina has a packed house. They're getting fired up of who can come up. And then they would go to Louisville and Triple A, just as just an example, and we'd follow them there as the minor league uh, prospects playing against the big league team, and then they go to the big league stadium. So I like that idea. I mean, in Florida, I think it would be a cool idea in Florida. I don't think it would get that much juice, in my opinion. But yeah. I like going to the minor league ball clubs and, and going out there because now it's like, all right, this is what we got to look forward to, man. You know, the Reds are going to be – you know, I was with the Reds at the time. They're looking pretty good. So let's see how that transpires. I do like that. You get four or five days before, have an exhibition, let the major league team go to some of those minor league parks. If I gave you the option, Kratz – Futures game Florida, futures game Arizona. We draw it all up. We play it big. We have the big boys showing up for it or the breakout series that's going on right now. What is better for baseball? And what would you rather get a ticket for? 
I think you are getting a ticket to see your team. So I'm going to say the other one. I th- I'm going to say the other one because, or the breakout series is what I'm going to, I'm going to vote for. I get it. The futures game thing will be awesome. It'd be a single one event. We need to sell this game to the regions that they're in. Hey, you know what? Now I'm going to go and watch this guy in double A Reading because I watched the breakout series in Clearwater. Now I'm going to go watch the Lakewood game. And a lot of these teams now, the the parks are closer to their actual city, which I think could be a boom for the game. I think it could be huge. Let's bring in Przinski, who's making a little special appearance for us. We're going to bring on Josh Donaldson soon. AJ, you got it good, dude? All right. Um, do, you, do you want to chime in on this for a sec while we get JD ready? Do you know where we were going here? Couldn't hear a thing. Okay, cool. You got us now, right? <laughs> I do. Um, okay. But, yeah, whatever you guys talk about, I agree with what Scott said, and that's it. I don't even know. Oh, good. Then we're done. <laughs> uh, it, it, we're going to bring in Josh Donaldson in a sec. AJ, do you know about the breakout series that's going to happen soon with MLB? So you have the minor league players playing each other. So here's my question. Would you rather have that, or should we have – Futures game Florida, Futures game Arizona, because obviously they can make that trip for one day and we can really jazz that up and sell the future stars of the sport versus certain players that are just not playing with their big league club for a day. You know, like my point earlier was, would I rather watch Jackson Holiday in the breakout series or would I rather watch him in a spring training game playing alongside Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, etc.? cetera? I, I just don't know if there's going to be much pop to this. I appreciate trying to have the minor leaguers stand out more and try and sell our young players in the sport. I just think kind of an all-star, bring them all together kind of setup does it much more so for me. What about you? Agreed. Let's just have one game in Arizona, one game in uh, Florida, make it a big deal, make it like the Futures game, do it, and then get these kids back to their camp where they have a chance to make their team. Because, like, listen, it's like 30 kids per team, like, it's like 25 prospects. I mean, most organizations don't have 25 prospects. Let's be honest. Yep. Yep. That is true. Makes sense. All right. While we have a moment, we'll charge the mount, and then we'll get to Donaldson. Gavin Lux, the starting shortstop for the Dodgers. But wait a minute. So – Dave Roberts said the team still has a lot of confidence in Lux, but wouldn't fully commit to him being the starting shortstop to start the season. The quote from Roberts is, performance matters. And the issue seems to be centered around defense and specifically the throwing arm. He's coming back from a lost season. Remember, it sucked last year. It was right around when this show was born. He went down with the torn ACL. So, Yeah, I I think this was just a case of hope and understanding that oh man no this he's gonna be fine like let, let's just put it out there he's gonna be our shortstop but you got to make sure he's 100 percent healthy for one and you got to <clears> make <throat> sure he's he's back to the grind and ready to go i mean one thing to say something but one thing to see something as well so i i think what they're they're kind of backtracking here a little bit um there might be something a little more that they're not talking about what's going on with him um that's only speculation but you know how these things go guy has an elbow problem oh it's just you know muscle strain then it turns into uh you know tommy john or something so it's like what is the real deal going on right here how i know defense is huge you got to go left to right you got to understand you know where to be but he's a great athlete i think it's just going to be a matter of time but I, i think maybe he just needs more time because the kid's a stud uh any way you put it he's gonna hit so i i think maybe it's the movement parts on defense, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure there. So just a little backtrack about what they say. That's why sometimes it's easier to be quiet than to, than to speak up. That, that's true. And I never, want, I never want teams to be quiet because – but when you say things out there, then you got to kind of – you got to answer it. And sometimes stuff in baseball doesn't come true. It's essentially talking about four plays that Gavin Lux has made. His first throw – of spring training, he airmailed. Then yesterday, when he was playing behind Yamamoto, he made a diving play, and he bounced it over to first, but he two, two hopped it over to first. And then there was another play where he went in the hole deep to his backhand, and he bounced it again. 
Now they wrote in the article like routine plays that should have been shouldn't have been bounced. I don't a hundred percent know about that, but mm. is that in his mind? Is that first airmail throw in his mind? Only the team knows. Only you know Dave Roberts has to understand the psyche of a player that they're going to be playing opening day in thirteen days. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to our first guest here on FT Live, and he just announced his retirement and AJ making the cameo to bring him on as well. Why don't, why don't you make the the uh, the intro here, AJ? Well, I mean, for, former MVP, former guy that used to be pretty good at baseball. Now I think he's on the professional golfing circuit <laughs> with that hat, and I'm assuming he's pulling into a golf course right now. The bringer of rain and third baseman. I guess you could be a catcher. Were you, can we consider you an next catcher? But Josh Donaldson is in the house, and I can't wait for this chat. Yeah, I, you could definitely consider me an ex catcher. And, uh, you know, I did make a few starts in the big leagues b- back there. So, uh, but I appreciate you guys having me. I mean, I mean, are you on the golf course right now? Are you headed to the golf course? Yeah, I'm in the parking lot right now. I'm not sure why my camera setting is like half of my face. I feel like I have it right. Is this better? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Here we go. Here we go. Nice. Sorry you. about that. What an adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> Life's all about adjustments, isn't it? Wait, are you in Florida or Arizona? I've been uh, actually back home in Bama right now. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. So, so Josh, t- take us through what the last few days have been like for you since you made it official that you're going to end your career. Yeah, it's uh, kind of been a whirlwind. Uh, the last couple months have been really thinking about it even more, and I felt like that was the right decision to make. And you know, I didn't uh, expect or realize like the amount of support that I was going to get from a lot of people. And it's kind of been overwhelming at times, but uh, in a good way. Let me ask you this, JD. Hope all is well, brother. Um, Thanks. Sir. Question for hey, at the end of my my career a couple of years ago, it was it was tough for me because you're sitting there talking to your agent every other day. When's somebody gonna call? What the heck's going on? Blah yeah. blah blah. I know I know you wanted to play, man. Was there a situation where either you weren't getting the calls or you just decided, you know what? I'm totally done here because for me, I wasn't getting the calls. And it was like, you know, I saw the writing on the wall, which was a pain in the ass, to be honest. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, last year, whenever I got released from the Yankees, uh, I actually came to grips with it pretty quick. I'm like, I don't I don't think I'm probably going to get another phone call. And, and that would be okay. Like, I'd be like, I'm totally satisfied with that. Then I went to Milwaukee and, you know, I kind of felt like I – life uh give it to me and, and i felt the spark and um you know i went into the off season thinking that i was possibly going to try to give it one more go but you know there was a few teams that were calling interested i mean i didn't have any like firm offers out there but i think in my own mind around january i was telling my agent like dude like stop taking calls i really you know i don't think that i even want to play anymore um, I think I want to, you know, just get going and live in life a little bit. And, you know, there's been a lot of things, as most of you guys know, or all of you guys know, you sacrifice to, to be where you're at. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to get back to, you know, maybe start trying those things. Okay. So, one, I got to ask, spring training is obviously deep. Do you miss it? Because the first spring is always weird after you played for a while. And then, two yeah. – it's kind of awesome when you have all this free time and you can just like, oh, I want to go play golf. I want to do this. I want to do that. Like, it's kind of cool a little bit when you're first at, you retire and you're like, man, I, I missed all these things like that all the regular people get to do. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, to be home and you know, be able to wake up with, you know, my daughters in the morning, feed them breakfast, and then at nighttime be with them every night has been pretty uh, fantastic just, you know, our two kids are really small, so to see them changing every day is, is awesome. And to play golf is also a, a fun hobby of mine. And, um, yeah, I mean, spring training, is, it's fun. It's like the first, going back to school for the first day. You get to, with the turnover in baseball, you see a lot of new faces, meet a lot of guys either you played with or that you've heard a lot about um, or played against, excuse me. And, um, 
yeah, and just really trying to form those bonds early on. But I haven't missed it to this point to answer your question. All right. So I got a comment and a question for you. First comment is from Josh Tolley. He said, what's up, Big Daddy? <laughs> yeah, he knows what time it was. <laughs> he knew he knew he knew what time it was. So that will lead me that will lead me into my next question. Your edgy, your edgy way that you played. AJ actually said this about himself on his first, like one of our first shows that we did. The edgy way that you played coming across as like a jerk to teammates, coming across as a, I mean, to guys you play against, and then teammates are like, oh man, this guy, you know, can you believe he said this about me? Did that make you a better player? And now that you're done playing, are you happy about how that you handled it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. It's kind of – and this is a, a big reason why I wanted Brzezinski on, on the show too. Not be, I mean, he's a friend of mine, but he can relate to, you know, being that ultra-competitive, kind of do what it takes if it gets under somebody's skin type of guy. Uh, I didn't care if the other team liked me. I, I cared if my own team liked me. And if my own team liked me and we were all good, that was uh, what I was about. And to get back to the story, was it, it was like 2013 or 14 when I was with the A's. And this is what I – like social media just came about a thing. And the play is in the ni- bottom, bottom of the ninth inning. We were in Arlington, just a regular season game. <laughs> And I'm at first base, and it's three-two uh, pitch. Seth Smith up to the uh, up to plate, hits a line drive to center field. Short hops, kind of Craig Gentry. He uh, put off the chest and it got away. Well, all was moving on the play, and I felt like I could score. We were down by one, and I ran through the stop sign from the third base coach and kept going. And Elvis Andrew makes a perfect one-hop throw. Krasinski does like a the best, like most textbook of home plate possibly almost breaks my ankle at the same time and he X's me for the third out of the game <laughs> Boom! And he just like pop like does that right there and I had just got on social media and after the game you know you're checking see what's going on and I see this video because I didn't see Przinski do it at the time and I see the video, and I just responded on there. I said, well, there won't be any sliding next time. <laughs> Good. And, and, so, and, so, and so it was like two weeks late. I know, I know, I know you're going to love this story. You love this. And uh, so it was like two weeks later, or like a month later, I can't even remember the exact date. We're playing them at our house or at, at, in Oakland. It was like the fourth or fifth inning. I'm at second base. There was two outs, ground ball through the six hole, and Elvis Andrews makes a phenomenal diving catch like deep in the outfield, uh, but keeps it from going to left field. And I saw him catch it, and I'm like, screw it, I'm going to try to go anyhow. And so I took off, and more so with the intent of not sliding. And uh, you know, I was able to get a lick on uh, Prasinski. Box is my next AB, and I don't know how he's going to respond. You know, I was a pretty young guy at the time for major league service st- uh, status. And he gets in, I get in the box, and he looks at me and he goes, You good? Yeah, I'm good. He goes, All right, let's play some ball. And that was it. And it was so cool. Like for me, that was like one of the, like he knew what it, I don't know if he did know what it was about. I felt like he knew what it was about, but you used to could be able to do that before a lot of these rules were in play. That, that was, was it. it. I, I love, love that. that. By, By the way, way I, I got, got two words, words for you. you. Suck it! Listen, here's the thing, JJ. JJ like, like, do you remember, remember the bat you had when uh, you were facing Darvish and he had thrown you like 20 sliders in a row and you, and you like stared at him? You, like, kicked the dirt, and you, like, stared at him, and I stood up, and I'm like, the, the fuck, fuck are you doing? You, you looked at me, go, trying to find his release point, point. and I'm like, well, here comes another slider. Find this one. Or something. And you were like, and you ended up getting, I think you stuck out, but then you ended up getting hit. And I was like, 
I was like, I was all right, like, I, I like, like this dude. dude. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, I remember the at bat. My first fifteen at bats off Darvish. He punched me out probably twelve times, and he threw me sixty-seven different type of sliders. And I, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I can't figure this guy out. I'm like, I'm not good enough to sit here and figure it out. So I got to try to find a mental strategy to put myself to see where he's at. And I think I got like right on top of the plate and I was just like egging him on to throw a fastball and he threw a slider and I go, okay, now I know. And uh, (laughs) next pitch was a slider. I said, next pitch is a slider and I was able to get a base hit and I had a little bit of success off of him, but it was way more than uh, I ever even came close to before that. So in the, I think in the game of baseball, Sports, all sports, you're always trying to find some type of mental edge and where it's going to try to make you a better player. And, you know, I say this about Aaron Judge, and I mean this with all due respect, not many people can hit a home run off of a guy and, like, be smiling, like, around second base, and the pitcher just be like, yep, he's just better than me. Like, it's it's going to happen, you know. <laughs> and, like, for me, I just – I. My style was never I, – I couldn't really be kind of like a happy-go-lucky type of guy, and I always played with, you know, a certain type of fire. <laughs> I can't hear. There we go. AJ, can you talk? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Wait, audio. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Maybe it might just be it might just be me and you, Josh. We can talk golf. Are you playing in Dallas? What's that? Are we playing any golf? Yeah, are you playing in Dallas? Uh, I mean, I want to try to get out there. I, I mean, I just news just kind of hit. I was going to talk to hopefully Flasky soon. All right, good because I need some competition. Because you know us, <laughs> us ten to us ten to twenty place finishers. We're really you know we all we all, you know we need to stick together. Well, I'm I'm trying to uh, you know actually get a little time to practice now, so hopefully I'll be able to break the top ten. Okay, all right. What what do you do you? I, I was I always when I always ask this guys like when you, when you first retire, like besides golf and your daughters, what are you gonna do with your time? Because there's so much time to fill now, and, and you're gonna say like, oh, I can play golf. Well, people always say, well, you'll run out, and eventually you'll be like, I'm tired of golf, unless you're John Smalls, right? So what else do you yeah. do besides golf and hang out with your daughters, which is the most important thing? Yeah, it is. And, uh, I mean, I like to collect sports cards. Um, I mean, I, I, I've really been probably I've invested a decent amount of uh, cash into into that. And I like to do all the sports and, you know, try to see what, what happens with that. It kind of keeps me interested and in tune with, you know, all the sports, and I've always been a fan of football, basketball, and baseball. So it just helps me have a reason for that. What's Much your favorite card? Yeah. yeah. Can, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Uh, all right. My turn. <laughs> I'm jumping okay, out sorry. now. Um, sorry, sorry. I was talking about how good of a storyteller you are and how stories and stuff you and I had. So I'm covering the bottom of this, and I tell okay. people this story all the time with you and me in Toronto because yeah. – the bottom yeah. basically. No, they- show- <laughs> <laughs> if hey, if if this notebook was to slip now, we know we know where you live because I got I I I got the check down here. And I just don't you know we don't want people sending classy stuff. move. Yeah, you know what I mean. So tell tell everybody about this challenge that you you were feeling froggy one day and all of a sudden just jumped on me. How many did you finish with? I can't I couldn't see again. Do it. Let me see it one more I- time. Okay, I got you. Yeah, it was 
it, it was a big number. My my highest number here. If we can show it one yeah, more show time. One more time. Yeah. Hold on here. They're they're getting it up. Give me one second. It, it was a little 40. forty to thirty seven piece. Okay. Woo. All yeah. right, all right. So uh, here's the story. We we're in Toronto. We we play uh, the White Sox. I think it was like probably within the first three weeks of the season. And, yes. And uh, you know, Mister Frazier over there decided to go unconscious, and he, I think he had like ten the first three weeks. And he's over there, and you know, Todd is, is from the same cloth as me. He likes to talk, and you know, he like he's frisky as well. So. Well, he's giving me a little banter. I'm giving him a little banter. And uh, I, I was like, well, what do you got, 10 right now? I think I had like two or three. I said, I'll bet you uh, 10 grand right now, that at the, and I'll spot you 10. I'll spot you 10 home runs. I'm going to finish with more than you. And he was like, bet. And I said, all right, well, you know, Mr. Frazier had a great year, as we can see. And, and at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> He got me, and so I, I. The next year, we played him early in the season. I had a check waiting for him in his locker, and you know that's just what it was. That was how I, you know, like I said, always trying to put each other and shoot for the highest goals, and we feel really good about ourselves. And you don't think that there's anything that you can't do, and sometimes you know you get, oh, uh, you know you get your put put in your mouth sometimes and you know he put it in there for me and i had to pay it up <laughs> hey listen dude i tell this story to everybody like this is this sitting in, in in a place in my house where everybody can see it too and they're like no fucking way and i said yeah bro this guy's a man of his word and guess what he made me better that year just by opening his mouth and i said you know what? that's the type of guy i fucking love so i appreciate you man you got me to 40 home runs the only the, you know Last White Sox to ever do it. So let's let's hopefully that changes. A little this extra year. motivation. Hopefully it changes this year. What's his name? <laughs> awesome. Almost got Good me last great. year. Oh, Robert. Yeah. So I appreciate you, dog. <laughs> hey, I, pre- I appreciate hey. you too, man. And uh... <laughs> hey, hey, Josh. Question for you. Um, as someone who obviously you know broke out with the Oakland A's and you started thriving there. Um, what do you think about what's going on in Oakland and, you know, how sad will it be for those fans to be missing a team at some point if this whole Vegas situation goes through? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, uh, I feel like the A's have been supposed to move for 20 years now, right? So it's hard to get too ahead of yourself until it actually happens. Um, but what I'll say about this is, Fans are truly one of a kind, and they show up day in and day out when it's, you know, when they've went through teams that have won 60 games and, you know, teams that have won over 100 games uh, or 90-plus games and win the division, you know. So it's special, and I'm sure when uh, if that day does happen to where they, they move, it's going to be um, – missing out on a on a important fan base to you know major league baseball history for sure hey, josh is it, i gotta ask is this story true when you're with oakland you were yeah. raking and billy bean walks in and you go hey billy boy the price keeps going fucking up buddy you should have signed me is that a true story no that's not it that there's there's <laughs> stories not, there's stories that are similar to that very similar but that words that you just used, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's probably going to go in my book one day. I don't know if I if I, if I decide to write one. Just I want the real story now because I, that is something that I would totally say. So I can totally see you saying that to the general manager. Well, I had one contract dispute or conversation with Oakland when I was there, and it wasn't with Billy. It was with um, another guy. Say his name. I wouldn't want to embarrass him. Uh, who was a part of who? Who was a part of uh, you know the front office? And we were in Tampa. And it was the first month and a half of the season. And I think. I mean, I was going unconscious the first month and a half. And uh, Bo Mel called me in the office, and we were just talking. And one of our 
front office guys was there too. And Bo Mill was like, hey, such and such, let's get JD uh, locked up to a deal right now. And me and Chip Hill and, you know, a lot of the coaches and stuff like that, we would talk. And uh, Jason Kipnis, he had uh, just signed a deal for like six for 54. And I think there was a other couple contracts like that. And he mentioned something like that for me. And I go, no, I'm, I'm not taking that deal. I'm sorry. Um, so I could kind of see what, what they were. He gone. Phone call. Phone call. Yeah, that, that's probably what happened. Fun fact. Are we good? Phone call. He gone. Oh, you're We're back. back. We're, We're getting back. a phone call. Keep it going. No, I didn't have a phone call. I don't think. Uh, where, did you, where did I? Where did you hear me? Where was? It? You said you, you said no to six for fifty four. <laughs> you, we got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't okay. know what's going on here. Yeah, you, you said uh, no to six or 54. Yeah, and so I said, I could kind of see what was going on. And I looked at him, I said, look, you want me to uh, save you 50 million right now? And they're like, what is it, J.D.? I go, pay me seven for 100 right now. Said, because if the season goes the way that it's going to go, I'm going to be asking for 150 at the end of it. So, look, I just saved you 50 million. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly that. what AJ that's exactly what AJ was saying. So that but that but that's the edge that you play with. That's oh, that's shit. the edge that you play with. I want to take you to two to two events in your career. Which one was more scarring or which one will you forget first? Manny Machado throwing his bat at you or <laughs> How close you came to making that play and ruining our run to the World Series in 2014 on Salvi's ball down the line. Oh, my God. Like you really want me to punch you in the dick right now. <laughs> that up. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, anyway. Um, <laughs> one... Jesus, she just, I mean, I still, I still have nightmares about that play. I, I still have nightmares about it. Um, what was the first one? I just got flabbergasted after that. <laughs> Manny Machado throwing his bat at you. Okay, okay. So the Manny Machado thing, I wasn't actually on the field for that. Um, I just got to take it out of the game because we were winning like 12 to 1 or something like that. And so I don't think he was directing it towards me. Uh, gotcha. I just think that maybe the bat got a little less sticky around the pitcher for some reason. So, okay, the Salvi play then, because I was there live. I mean, you, I even yeah. live, even live. I didn't realize that you touched it. Watching yeah, the replay did. back, you touched that ball. The ball I'm talking about for everybody who's not understanding it was 2014, the greatest wild card game of all time. Salvador Perez hits a slider that was in the left-handed batter's box off just off of JD's glove at third. Yeah, and uh, you know what was even more pain why I still think about it to this day is because I knew a slider was being called. I go I'm going to take a step over to my left because I knew where uh, I think it was Jason Hamill who was throwing uh, pitching for us. I knew he had a nasty breaking ball. It was going to be over there two strikes. I just didn't realize how long Salvi's arms were at the time. And, uh, you know, I had taken a step over to try to cover the hole a little bit because I, um, I felt like with the speed that was at second base, if there was a hit to my left or a hit to my right, the game was going to be over. And so I was trying to maximize my range as much as possible, and I was wrong. And uh, that's why it's still that's why it's still it still burns in my crawl uh, that day. But it is what it is. Like you said, that ended up being one of the best wild card games that I've been a part of, uh, uh, minus probably Baltimore in 2016 when Edwin hit the walk off home run in the wild card game. That was pretty special too. Yes, it was. So. I know you run out of time. Last question here for me. Uh, you're a big card guy. You collect cards. I want to know 
what is the most valuable card that you have right now or the <laughs> most uh, the card that you will never let go of oh man i got uh it just depends the market so mm -hmm. um you never know until the next auction but i have i have some really nice cards i don't know if i want to I, I mean, I guess I showed one of them on Instagram. I have a dual 2004-2005 exquisite logo man of Kobe Bryant and uh, LeBron James. That's LeBron James' second year. So it's a one-of-one. -one. Mm. Um, you can look it up and see how much I paid for that. It's it's uh, it's up there, but <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot and uh it's a card that i believe in for long term and it'll probably be one that i have for a really long time very nice brother very love nice. that love that well josh this was awesome dude go have a great round uh appreciate you joining us congrats on the retirement hopefully we'll catch you again soon all right all right guys i appreciate you thank you thanks aj with the, with the tx sign on the so way good. out <laughs> <laughs> thank you jd good stuff and, and aj we no appreciate problem, it, dude. thanks josh and, and aj thanks for swinging by dude go go enjoy your round uh back to the the three the og fraser friday three here on ft oh no round he said no golf but still enjoy your day he just wears a cloud um, shirt on his off days i love that i love that that's respect right there that's respect we're gonna get ken rosenthal coming up in just a few so let's hop back to a charge the mounds topic because it's super fresh and it's yo bro it's that was signing. awesome it's a little signing um ryan stanick signs a, a deal no, with awesome. the really seattle mariners the audio, dude. my house is like fucked up uh, <laughs> aj's fired up yeah i don't know if everyone else is hearing no, him, but... aj aj's on the line <laughs> <laughs> there we go that could have been funny i think we still got him all right now let's go to ryan stanick um signs a deal with the seattle mariners here's a dude kratz that had an era in the four range this past season in houston um the year before that his numbers were insane he had a 115 in 54 and two-thirds innings um for Seattle, in my mind, they've actually done as well of a job as any team in baseball at building a bullpen. So if I had to guess, over under uh, three ERA for Stanek, I'm taking the under this year. So I don't know if it's a major or minor league deal. I would hope it's a major league deal, given the track record for this dude, especially the last few seasons. But with the way things have been going, every team has stood very solid on their ground that – it is deep enough in spring training that most dudes are going to get minor league deals, even if they should be getting major league deals. Your thoughts? I mean, on the minor league deal or major league deal stuff, I talked about it so much the other day. My thoughts on the signing, I am totally in your camp. The Mariners have done an incredible job of being able to create pitching. I would even say starting pitching and relief pitching, you know, almost rivaling the race. And it's from minor league system. It's from – getting guys from other systems and being like, hey, I think you do this really well. Stanek is Stanek is pro. Played with him a little bit with the Rays. This guy's going to go out and do his job. I'm going to take the under on a three ERA for sure. Let's bring in Ken Rosenthal right now, FT Senior Insider, joining us. Ken, good to see you. And I heard that you were at Braves camp today. So let's start there because we're going to talk to Alex Anthopoulos later. How did it go? Does this look like a 150 win team? <laughs> 150 might be a little bit excessive, but they're going to be good. And the biggest takeaway for me is Chris Sale. They're very excited about Chris Sale. Clearly he has to stay healthy and we know that, but he is healthy right now. He's throwing the ball well. And one of the players said to me this morning, let's say you're in a best of five division series and you've got Max Fried and Spencer Strider throwing the first two games. And no matter how that turns out, Chris Sale's going game three, a healthy Chris Sale. If that comes to pass, and if he is the guy he once was, or even close to that, it's a very interesting rotation. They've also added Aaron Bummer to the bullpen. They're just really strong. And I know Kellenic has struggled so far, but there are people here who are high on him as well. There is no reason to believe this team will be anything other than a powerhouse again. 
Hey, Ken. Um, love what you do, big dog. Good to see you again. Um, Thanks. Question for you. Ronaldo Lopez. Excuse me while I jump into this frame here. Ronaldo Lopez. I'm, I'm, I'm just intrigued by this guy here, man. He's, he can be a starter. He can be a reliever. He's a guy that they're going to look for a lot during the season. I feel like they got a steal there with him if he's healthy and rearing back and throwing, the, you know, in the high 90s, 100 range. Where do you see him finishing off? Do you see him as a fourth, fifth starter? Or do you see him as a reliever right now? Todd, I'm glad you mentioned him because I neglected to when I was talking about their additions, and he was the first, and he's a big one. I don't know where I see him. I don't know that they know where they see him just yet because they're stretching him out as a starter. That was the intent when they signed him. But they know that he can become a dynamic, multi-inning part of their bullpen as well. So either way, he represents great depth for them. Right now, they can really turn it either way. It depends kind of on Bryce Helder, how he performs, and some other things as well. But man... They are just in a really deep position. They have some younger pitchers as well. A.J. smith Trevor, we saw him last year. I just kind of like where they are. Obviously, we know how good they are. They've been so good for so many years under Anthopolis. But this team maybe has a little bit more depth than some of the others before, and that's what's intriguing to me. Is there a sense in camp that they have to change something from – making the team, making, you know, winning all these games and making the playoffs. And now we have to figure out how to win in the first round, or is it just eh, whatever, we're good. That hasn't really been a topic that came up in my conversations with players today. Maybe I should have asked Eric, maybe you should be the reporter and I should be just sitting there <laughs> with, in your seat. But <laughs> I don't get the sense that they do feel that way. Now, if they win the division again, and if they get a buy again, and they're sitting there looking at a layoff like they did last year and the last couple of years. You've heard Brian Snicker say this spring, uh, it's not ideal. Well, they're going to have to figure out a better way. Obviously, they're going to need to maybe have more serious simulated games. I don't know what they were doing before necessarily. They were doing simulated games, but I don't know how intense they were. It's a challenge. And it's interesting because when I was in Philly's camp, I will tell you that the remarks by Snicker did not necessarily get received well because they felt, hey, we won the series, we beat them, that's the way it is. We would have rather had the bye. All guys want rest at this at that time of year. But I do understand the other side of it as well. We've seen teams get knocked out with buys in recent years, some very powerful teams, a couple of times with the Dodgers. It's not an easy thing to pick it back up again, but one point that a certain Phillies player made to me was, hey, all-star break, it's the same amount of time you're off and nobody complains then. So they're going to have to figure it out if it gets to that point, and I'm sure they'll be delighted if it does. Hey, we talk about uh, Gavin Lux a little bit earlier today about how he's trying to get back uh, playing-wise. They said he's our shortstop. Dave Roberts came out and said that now. A little backtrack a little bit. Um, is it one of those cases where he needs to get acclimated a little more? They need to see him throw the ball better as we talked about earlier is it just something where they're just like well maybe we need to ease off the gas pedal a little bit so talk to us a little bit about gavin and what you think uh might transpire there it's clearly a shift in what they've been saying initially he was the shortstop he's going to be the shortstop he'll be our guy opening day and now it's we're not so sure and the reason they're not so sure is because he seems to have a case of the yips again and this is one of the most baffling things in baseball when this happens to a player. And I always go back to what Tim Kirkchen told me when I was starting my career. I've mentioned this before. This game is really hard to play. And I know people might think, well, the yips, come on, just throw the ball. It gets inside guys' heads. And Gavin Lux at one time was one of the game's best prospects. He still has a world of ability, and he still is someone that people on other teams tell me they believe he's going to hit. But he has to be able to hold down the position. Now the question becomes, what if they turn away? Where will they go? They've got Miguel Rojas. He's a shortstop. They've got Kike Hernandez, who, when healthy, might be able to play the position from time to time. But I would expect they would explore some other options. And we've talked about Willie Adamas with them forever. My understanding of that is that while the Dodgers might want Willie Adamas, the Brewers don't necessarily want to trade Willie Adamas. So... There's always a price. You guys know that for every player. But right now, 
it just seems they're going to have to see what happens with Lux over the next couple of weeks and then maybe go with Rojas and Kike to start the season and figure it out as they go along. It's a tough, tough spot for him, but hopefully he comes back. Uh, you, and, you and Eno wrote a great article about pitching injuries. Now, we talk about this all the time, and I know, as every team knows, injury time on the IL – is the largest cost of any team because you lose all that time with these pitchers. Do you feel like your sense of all that you guys dug into, and you can hit on so many other things, but do you feel like your sense of teams is closer to the aspect of we don't want to get guys hurt because you interviewed the Rays in this too, or it's we want to get the most out of guys because you can't be 50-50 right down the line. Right now, Eric, there's no question that teams lean toward performance more than availability. They want to use these guys. They want them to throw as hard as they can for as long as they can and come what may. That's the problem, actually, that pitchers are not backing off in any way. They are going full out all the time. And Dr. Keith Meister, who we interviewed for this story, he's the Texas Rangers team physician, the leading orthopedic surgeon, one of them, in the game today. He cited the sweeper and the power change as particular problems. He says pitchers grip the ball with a death grip now, and they're trying to max out every pitch. That's the issue. And at some point, some teams are going to have to figure out a better way because we see this every single year. Pitchers go down, and it's not for any one reason. It's for a variety of reasons. Maybe the answer, and we allude to this in the article a little bit, is for people or pitchers and teams to start – focusing more on location than just pure stuff. We know pure stuff has incredible value. It's what gets great hitters out. But as Eric Neander said in the article, location can make up for some of that loss of effectiveness with the stuff if you are really good with that. And maybe the art of pitching needs to come back a little bit more so that these guys aren't going down all the time. I will say this, and I didn't mention this in the story, but... Not only hard throwers get hurt, not only pitchers who throw sweepers and power changes get hurt, all pitchers get hurt. It's an <laughs> industry-wide problem. MLB is conducting a study right now. They've interviewed more than 100 people so far, and eventually they plan or they expect to form a task force. We can talk all we want, and we have talked. They've had people on this for a while now. They're trying, but behaviors have to change. And I don't know how you legislate that, it almost seems like it has to happen organically within organizations for teams to say, okay, we're going to look for something a little bit different here. We're going to stress availability, to get back to your question, Eric, as much as performance. And it's funny that <clears throat> availability, you know, turns into all of a sudden the velo. It's like that's probably – that's one of the reasons why I didn't – I don't play anymore because of velo, because of the nasty movement, because of how hard guys throw. Now, if that was the case, me and Kratz, you're going to have to come in my cage here and work out a little more. I don't see that happening. But my question to you is about Tommy John surgeries. Um, used to be you get Tommy John, you're good for the rest of your career. Now, in the article which you've written, all of a sudden now guys are getting Tommy John. The next thing you know, instead of 10 years down the road, maybe three to five as, as we've seen, they got to get another one. So what, what is that about? Is that because of velocity? That was a direct quote, Todd, that you're referring to from Dr. Keith Meister. That's what he said. It used to be you get one, then it was one every 10 years if you need a second one, and then it was seven to eight, then it's three to five, which is where it is now. It's all of the above when it comes to trying to figure out what the reason is. Velocity is certainly one aspect of it. Also, the breaking pitches, more are being thrown than ever before. And as I go back to the grip and the way pitchers grip them, there's more strain on their arms than ever before. So I would say when it comes to trying to figure out the cause, the best answer is all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good one. Ken, so I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. What stands out to me is the average lifespan in a big league career for a pitcher. Under 2.7 seasons. Well, the major league average salary is sub a million dollars. These dudes spend their whole lives getting to this point. They might shine for a few years and then their arm breaks and they disappear. So how do you think the players, the talent, 
uh, evaluate a situation like this that you know keeps turning into players with shorter shelf lives and not actually getting to be millionaires for being the best in the world at this sport, which is a whatever, $15 billion sport. Well, Scott, if you're a pitcher and your career is lasting an average of under 2.7 years, the average pitcher is not even getting to arbitration. That's alarming. And yet, we refer to this in the story as well. Most pitchers view injuries as an occupational hazard, and they kind of accept that this is part of it. And Alex Cobb is quoted at the end of the article as saying, I've had every surgery you can imagine, but I got to the big leagues. And that's the trade-off that occurs. Now, you hate to hear that from any player. No one wants to see any player hurt. We want these guys performing at their best and their healthiest. But the way pitching has evolved, it's not like that. They have a certain shelf life, as you mentioned. And it's just really difficult for most pitchers to sustain long careers. You have to be successful. You have to stay healthy and probably have a little bit of good luck on your side as well. Doing doing this research, talking to people, do you feel like the teams are doing this? Because I'm kind of sometimes a naysayer. I'm looking at maybe the, the negative part of this. Are they doing this research to say, whoa, hey, we're not, we're not giving a pitcher a long-term deal. And the reason is, look at all this research. Look at all the research we have. Guys are going to blow out. Anybody that throws this sweeper this hard, this change up this hard is going to blow out. Don't go over five years because there's a chance during that time he's going to miss a season for Tommy John. Eric, that should not be the intent of this study. That should not be what this is all about. What this should be about is injury prevention. There is an economic component to everything in the game. We know this. We talk about it quite frequently. I don't believe teams are seeing that way, seeing it that way. Dr. Keith Meister basically said he's talked to agents about this very phenomenon and he understands that there is an economic thing going on and maybe it's the next man up mentality and teams feel they can just cycle through arms. His point was there aren't enough arms to go around. And John Smoltz has made that point on many Fox broadcasts where we've been together. I would agree with that. You can't just keep blowing people out. There's not that many great arms in the world to sustain the turnover that's going on in our game every single year. That said, it's undeniable that if you have a bunch of up-down guys, guys you send to the minors, you just keep cycling them through and cycling them through, those are not players getting paid. Now, here's the interesting part of it for me, a paradox, and this might be another story down the line. Pitchers aren't being developed to last in both durability and within the course of a game, right? We see more five-inning starters than we've ever seen before. And yet, who gets paid? Aaron Nola got paid. Why? Because he's an innings guy. Zach Wheeler got paid. Why? Because he's an innings guy. Blake Mm -hmm. Snell's still out there. Now, I'm not going to oversimplify it and say that's the reason. There are other reasons as well. But it's almost as if the game is talking out of two sides of its mouth. Won't let minor league pitchers develop durability within a game might might not extend them during a game and yet that's who they value at the end of the day well if you value that develop that and maybe you even get it before they're free agents how about that preach did that that's a great that's a great point did you in in all this did you come across anybody that admitted to the fact that it is way easier to teach velo people have never pitched before and know how the body mechanically works is way easier to teach than command. It didn't come up in the course of these conversations, Eric, but certainly that is a verity of the game, right? It's something that we know to be true, that you can accelerate velocity perhaps better than you can accelerate command or improve velocity in a better way than you can improve command. My colleague on this story, you know, Saris, has written extensively about all of these kinds of things. And that's a problem in a way because command almost should be number one. It gets back to that location discussion I was bringing up earlier, how if location can erase some of the gap between great stuff and not, well, maybe we need to teach location better, we being the sport of baseball. I don't have the answers here. I'm not pretending I have the answers. The one thing I was satisfied with this article that it accomplished, I believe, is that it got people thinking. 
and hopefully people see this and they might not agree with every point Dr. Keith Meister made. They might not agree with the points that some of the other people made, but this is a huge topic. It's always a huge topic. Every year we talk about this and at some point, it just seems to me the sport has to find a way to get to a better place. Last question for me. Are you like shocked right now or, or no, are baseball people shocked right now that Monty and uh, Snell haven't been picked up? I mean, it's just, it's just ongoing and ongoing. I mean, what have you been hearing? This is just, it's insane to me to see all these big names that are still out there that don't have a job. I don't know that people are shocked at this point. Todd has been dragging on all winter. So it's not like it's, you're waking up in the morning and it's hitting your face. Wow, what a surprise. Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery aren't signed. They haven't been signed since November 1st. So I don't know that I see it that way. And I would say that it's alarming that they're not signed at this point. It's March 8th. And I know Scott Boris will tell you, well, these guys are training at my training institute. They're fine. They're doing everything a normal pitcher in spring training would do, throwing bullpens, live batting practice. No, they're not performing in game-like situations. And I'm not saying Grapefruit League and Cactus League games are the end-all, be-all. But you guys know this, and I'll ask you guys both. There is a certain part of conditioning in spring training that simply involves standing on the field in spikes. And yeah. maybe these guys are doing that, but there's something to that. And it's part of it. And I don't know that they're getting it the same way that the players here are getting it. They are getting the conditioning in the same way. It just doesn't seem to me that that's very likely at all. So now we are, what, three weeks away, a little bit more from opening day. You're looking at a situation where they may not be ready to go opening day, or they might not be as good as they should be opening day, which is a bigger concern because they're going to get paid. Not a great situation. Yeah, well, maybe next week, but I've been saying that for months. <laughs> Ken. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy some camps over the weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ken Rosenthal. Uh, back on fair territory as well next week, so stay tuned on that front. Um, let's hit hot corner, and then we're going to talk to Bailey Ober. Yeah, let's sizzle, and <laughs> let's bring up John Fisher, owner of the Oakland A's, Again? speaking. <laughs> well, he spoke. Oh, so we wanted to, you know, get the, on the phone perspective here on, on the, the phone. phone. Yeah. Right. Cell phone or that old Could, school phone with the cord? Probably old school. with the <laughs> okay. cord. All yeah. Not the most highly educated speaker on the planet here. So uh, here's a direct quote from him in the Chronicle article with Susan Slusser. Um. <laughs> He said he likes he said he likes the new ballpark renderings being compared to an armadillo. Quote, I think the armadillo is an underrated animal, and I think the A's are underrated at times. And they also said, but comparisons to the Sydney Opera House is a huge compliment because that's a building that's withstood the test of time. Oakland armadillos? Is this real? Is he a real person? That's a bot. That was a bot, bot right? <laughs> bot statement. The armadillo is an underrated animal, and we're talking about moving from one city to the next. And now this is where where we're going. We're going down this. You saw these here. renderings, right, for the new park? Yeah, in I've, Vegas. Uh, listen, whatever it is, I I mean, I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. If that's, I mean, listen. At yeah, the that's of, what it looks like. At the end, from of the, the outside, day, it's Sydney, uh, Australia. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just don't. He's just going down this hole here where he just doesn't need to. We want to hear him talk, but you're going to talk about an armadillo. Or, or is this being petty? Is this just being kind of like, oh, I'm going to comment on everything now? Like, I, I don't know. I, but they're still not over there yet. You know what I mean? They're still, it's not a done deal, right? It right depends what you, it depends what you call a done deal. I mean, yeah. this is, I think, the seventh <laughs> rendering in the past yeah. seven years. So, um, obviously, this is the first one in a different city, but I think there's still a lot left to be decided. Uh, you know what I was thinking of also, Kratz? Remember Fire Festival? Oh, yeah, where, where like it was a big bus. They brought everybody in to this island, and it was supposed to be this crazy thing. It ended up being awful. Correct. So the, I was having a nightmare 
last night that the renderings would actually just be some poles with sheets on top <laughs> once it actually gets built. That was Fire Festival. That was Fire Festival. I don't know exactly what that would be equal to in Vegas. I love the design. I love the design. I love the article about how they um, was it Evan Evan Drellick, I think wrote an article about mm -hmm. he read he he interviewed the architect. Yes. And the architect for the first like three paragraphs of the article, the article the architect was like, well, this is actually like the fifth time and I've really liked some of the other things that I had for Oakland in the spots that they were in Oakland and he's like but I do really appreciate this. And he kind of, he insinuated it's more of an armadillo, or he said it's more of a quote armadillo than the Sydney Opera House. He wasn't trying to steal that, that look, but to say for, for John Fisher, this whole thing to say, yeah, the armadillo is an underrated animal. What? Like the armadillo does nothing. It just, it's, <laughs> it scoots around and when it gets attacked, it rolls up in a ball until everything's gone and then it's completely safe to come back out of its shell. So maybe John Fisher's more like an armadillo. He's rolling up in his ball. The A's have taken off all comments on Twitter. So you can't comment on anything. You can't engage. Oh, and then they're gonna uncurl and be like, oh, hey, the A's are back. We're in Las Vegas. And the last thing is they, well, we're not talking about the stadiums in the wrong direction. This when the sun sets, the sun's going to be in the guy's eyes. So, oh yeah. my gosh! There's there's a lot of in play here that they haven't really justified. So we'll see what they want to do with that. Exactly, it's not going to look the way that it looks right now. That's the point, which means they still don't have real renderings. All right, let's get to our next guest on FT Live, <laughs> making his first appearance on here with us. Big Bailey Over from the Minnesota Twins joining us right now. Bailey, how you doing, dude? How's Fort Myers? It's good, man. Everything's going well down here. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you. Great to have you on. <laughs> yeah. He's a hawk. Well, what did I say yesterday, Kratz? What would he have to do? He would just have to duck under the screen. But, I mean, I'm sure the Twins guys are out there. They're just holding the screen up higher so that he can – so it can the, – the back screen, the little, like, Lee, Lee Health, I guess it is, twins.com, so he can get his entire huge carcass in there. Yeah, he got to put it all the way up to the ceiling. Oh. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, all right, so Bailey, let's start with you personally. Um, you get to camp, and what happens these days? Because obviously spring training ain't the same. Most guys are kind of working out all off season, and then camp is almost like reuniting with coaches and saying, hey, what can I improve on heading into this season? Obviously, the, the sexy topic sometimes is guys working on adding a new pitch, tweaking a new pitch. So what have you been up to? Yeah, sure. Um, at the end of the year, we came up with some goals some po uh, going into the offseason so we could have a couple months to work on things. And uh, this offseason was to get a little bit harder breaking ball. So that's what I've been throwing in camp so far, um, trying to use that a little bit more than the bigger sweeper that I have. Uh, it's it's working so far and just trying to get it consistent and seeing how hitters will react to it right now. Obviously when in the off season, you don't, you're just throwing to a bullpen catcher, but the last couple of games have been feeling really good and hopefully I can keep carrying that on and hopefully it stays. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because for, you know, non pitchers and younger guys, you talk about a hard breaking ball compared to a sweeper. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us about, you know, what the difference is in that. And, you know, is it different speeds? Is there different angles? explain to you know the guy that really doesn't understand what you know both of those are yeah sure so the sweeper is going to have a lot more horizontal movement it's going to go it's going to be typically a little bit slower um but it's it's going to have a lot more movement overall uh, and i had that last year and it worked okay for me but i think the pitch that was missing was like a hard kind of hard slider hard cutter that's something that's not going to move as much but it's still going to play off the fastball it's going to be a, a lot different motion from the fastball um for me, honestly, the biggest thing that I have to think about when I'm throwing it is staying staying behind it. I have to think like I have to think cutter. I have to think cut fastball, even though it might not relay as a cut fastball. But it, I, that's kind of what I have to think about, just because I I pronate so well, and when I get around my breaking balls, they just get too big and they can start to blend a little bit. So right now, I'm just trying to think cut fastball, throw it hard, 
and let the grip kind of do the work. And yeah, it feels really good right now. Hopefully going into these next couple of weeks, everything stays how it is. And maybe I can get a couple more ticks on the velo on it. You just talked about two things that we just discussed with Ken Rosenthal like two minutes ago. There was a big yeah. article from Eno Saris. I don't know if you're an article reader. It might be a good article for you to read, or you might be like, nope, don't want to talk about injuries. But yeah. I need you to comment on does a harder breaking ball feel like, oh, man, this is going to hurt my arm? Or do we feel like we have enough information, enough edutronic cameras, enough you know, arm sleeves that test that stuff to be like, no, this is going to be fine because I'm six foot nine. Yeah, I think, yeah, I know what article you're talking about. I saw it a little bit today. Um, but yeah, I th honestly, I think it's all how you get your hand position to at release. Um, everything that build, builds up throughout your mechanics, getting to release is going to tell you if it's healthy or not. Um, to me, the sweeper is a seam shifted wake pitch. It's not necessarily anything different than a curveball. It's just how you're gripping and how the grip, how you rip the hook on the seams, where the two seam grip is and it just catches in the in the air and it t takes a left turn. And if you are new to throwing that pitch, obviously it can, can take a little bit of wear and getting used to on your forearm. And I can think that's where a lot of guys are getting, kind of getting hurt from that is like they, the team or someone will introduce them to this pitch and then all of a sudden they're throwing 50 of them the day one. Um, but if you have like a whole off season to build up on your strength and stuff like that, I feel like you're, if you're able to manipulate the ball in a healthy way, get to the, the right release point in your mechanics, um, I feel like you should be able to throw with good health and be able to sustain that throughout the year. Building it up. That's a huge thing. Young young pitchers, young, you know, you have to throw to build up the stamina and to build the muscle. So I think that's awesome. Do you think the you even talked about velo a little bit? Like everybody wants more velo. I'm sure even your even your boy in the closer, Duran, is like, I think it'd be cool to throw 110. Like, I think it'd be cool to throw my 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 splunker thing, my splinker yeah. that he throws at 109. Like, I get that. Do you think that the velo is yes, it's rewarded by making the big leagues, but do you think yeah. the velo is more is 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 taught more because People that never pitched can't teach command. Uh, I think it's a easy way or it's a faster way to get to where you want to go. You know what I mean? I feel like it's, it is harder to be able to teach feel and teach command. Um, but there's ways nowadays where you can try to kind of cheat your body to being able to get to these velos that you want. Now they're not necessarily can be sustainable. Um, but the guys that are obviously doing it year in, year out have found something that works. Um, but yeah, it's just like whether it's in the weight room or you're doing specific drills to get your body into deeper movement patterns than you haven't done before and you see a spike in velo. Um, it just is it's, it is a risk and a, a reward system that everyone's kind of chasing right now. Obviously, if you want velo, it's going to help you get to where you want to be. Um, but if you can put those two pieces together, you get a little bit below and you find something in your mechanics that tightens everything up and you're able to make smaller misses instead of not being able to find the strike zone. And then that's the, that's the end goal really. It's just to find something that feels easy that you're able to move better and throw with command and have some added below behind it. Well, right now I'm listening to you a little bit. Like, I feel like I'm getting smarter, dude. You're a very smart person. <laughs> You, you talk well, you understand your body, you're in control of what you want to do. My next question would be, are you, are you big on analytics? Are you a big analytical guy when it comes to, you know, batters, like what these guys do, the numbers, these are what the numbers say. Are you a guy that says, you know what, right-handers get facing a guy like me or Kratz, fastball in, slider away, let's see what you got, come get it, let's go. Yeah, um, I, there's a little bit of both, obviously. Um, for me personally, uh, when I'm during the season, I'm the big thing that I'm looking at is the past two week trend of what everyone's doing. So what they're doing the last two weeks, um, if they're swinging it hot, if they're not, what's their misses during these last two weeks? What are they chasing in these last two weeks? Um, and I'll, I also have their year end or the whole year 
um, stats and stuff like that so I can compare if it's similar or if it's a little bit different. Um, but those are the, mainly the things that I'm looking at are chase rates, swing, swing rates on pitches, swing and miss rates, and whether they're aggressive early in counts. Like, what are they, are they trying to jump me or can I land something early in a count and get ahead? Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoy having a lot of analytical stuff behind me so I can rely on that if I have a question while I'm out there on the mound. Um, but at the end of the day, like if I, if I'm feeling good and I'm grooving, I'm going to go to my strengths. Bailey, question for you as somewhat of a fly ball pitcher. Would you rather wait, face a team that is pretty big swing and miss, but one of the more power happy teams in the sport can take a walk or two or contact killers that are maybe more towards the middle or the back um, of the home run rankings? Like, I don't know, maybe an Arizona Diamondbacks team from last year versus um, a poor man's version of, of say the twins lineup last year, which obviously was, was pretty powerful. You know, like what, what would you rather face if you're looking at a team identity wise, Cleveland could be in that mix too, contact wise, but their offense was pretty poor last year overall. What do you think? Um, I'm, I, we've had, we have talks about this with among our pitching staff. Um, but my answer is usually I would, I'd rather face a, a team that has power and has high swing and miss rates. Um, because if I can leverage counts, I'm going to be able to put them away pretty easy. Whereas a guy that's, a, if, a, if a team is filled with contact guys, they'll, they'll put your pitch count up high and make you work a little bit harder just to get them out. Obviously, if you make a miss to a power team, they make you pay for it. But if you're, if you're able to be able to dial in and lock in and command some stuff, you're going to have a pretty good day. So do you think the game is changing again in terms of what they value? And do you think any of that has to do with the rules changing right now? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, obviously the game, the game changes every year. Um, I think the last year, the last year or two, we've seen a big change on hitters trying to stay on top of the high fastball. Um, so I feel like the last, the last year I felt we saw a lot of hard lateral moving pitches, whether that's sinkers or cutters. Um, so I feel like the game is trending a little bit back to East West. And obviously that kind of dictates Strike zone dictates a lot of it. Um, a lot of guys are still getting a lot more misses above the zone and below the zone, but swings definitely are trending to be able to handle the high fastball right now. Um, so it's, it's it's a cat and mouse game with the hitters and pitchers every single year. You try to pick up what, see if a guy struggled with a high fastball last year, he's going to come back and he might be on it this year. Anybody might struggle with something moving on his hands. So it's 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 cat and mouse. You got to read you got to read swings mid at bat and kind of make an adjustment within yourself during the game. That's pretty interesting. Uh, I want to just move gears a little bit and congratulate you for one. Hall of Fame, College of Charleston. Uh, you got your name and number on the wall there. Uh, that you. must have felt pretty good, man. I mean, going – this is where you started. You know what I mean? It's one of those kickstarters to your career, and I know you're a guy that gives back, and, you know, it's got to feel pretty good knowing you're a Hall of Famer from a university that helped you pave the way to where you're at right now. Yeah, it was it was a really special weekend. Got to go down, and it was really cool that I was able to be inducted with some of my former teammates down there. So it was it was a great weekend to go down there. I got to show my show my kids where me and my wife went to school, and she played soccer. And our, our stadium is right next to the soccer stadium, so we got to show the kids uh, where we kind of spent a lot of hours when we were in college, out in the field, sweating. But it was it was a really special time just to be around family and kind of enjoy that weekend. Who else got who else got put in the Hall of Fame at the same time? You said your other teammates. Yeah, so uh, Blake Butler is a high A manager for the Pirate Pirates right now. He was my second baseman there. He played in the minor leagues for a little while. Uh, Carter Love is a reliever, played in the minor leagues for a little bit. He was a reliever when I was there. Uh, Dupree Hart, another middle infielder when I was there, got put in. So all all great ball players and great people. Dang, you guys were just putting everybody in. If you went to College of Charleston, you were getting put in the Hall of Fame. I mean, they're watering it down for you. You're the one in the big leagues, supporting a three ERA. What's I, I gotta? We we gotta call College of Charleston, Brad French over at College of Charleston. But hey, the, the wall's filled up already, dude. No more. I know it's a whole wall. It's a whole building of fame. <laughs> hey, what? Uh, who is somebody with the Twins? that we don't know about. We hear about Royce Lewis. Obviously, Byron Buxton's, you know, always up there, MVP candidate. The bullpen, everybody's throwing ridiculous heat, and, you know, it's 
to me, I thought it was the best bullpen in baseball last year. And then yeah. finally, you guys made the playoffs, and it was like, bang, now everybody in the world sees it. But who do we need to be watching that gets no love? It's a great question. Um, oh, man. Um, I want to say I mean, Willie Castro, unbelievable ball player, can do it all. Um, he made some plays on defense last year that was game saving catches. Um, whether those in the first inning can change the outcome of the game. Um, but he stole, I think, 33 bags last year, and that was kind of quiet. Hit 250, um, some pop. So, like, he, he's a guy that can do it all, play shortstop, play center field, left field, right field. Um, Louis Varlin is going to be, I think he's going to be a stud this year for us. Um, he came at, he was a starter. But, and then when we, uh, Put him in the pen at the end of the year. He's throwing 100 miles an hour. So some just we have we have guys that, like you said, aren't getting talked about that are can be big time dudes. Bailey, tell me about what Carlos Correa is up to. I mean, we had a really long chat with him last spring training. We'll get him again soon. But I mean, the, his philosophy is, especially with the young guys, he wants to teach them off the field. Your whole focus is, you know, playing your ass off, taking care of your body, getting that paycheck, winning ball games, the whole deal. And then obviously when he's with the with the team, same thing like you're talking about, really studying opponents, getting every edge possible. Do you get to see that? Obviously you're on the pitching side of things, but do you see that every day from him? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's definitely a pro's pro. Like he's all over everything trying to get better every single day. But also the main thing that I noticed from him when we first got him in 22 – um, obviously, he's a huge name, Carlos Correa. We sign him, bring him to the Twins. Um, we got guys ca getting called up for their first week in the big leagues, and he's going over there and talking to them, making sure, hey, if you need anything, let me know. Um, what what can I do to make you feel comfortable? Stuff like that. So it just goes to the type of teammate that he is and how much he wants all of us to be successful, to be honest with you. like He wants all of us to be able to do everything the right way, whether that's food, training, scouting you name it he's he's helped he's helping guys realize their full potential by just getting that little bit extra every single day have you ever seen you know other teammates that compare to that level obviously everyone has their strengths and weaknesses as a teammate is there anyone that's like that that you've experienced that's i guess that detailed with basically all of the young players that come through like you mentioned i wouldn't i don't know if i would he was the first person of that stature that I would say that was okay. able to do that. Obviously, there's a lot of guys that help out day-to-day um, -day stuff. Um, there, we have a lot of great teammates that support every single one of our guys, but I feel like the guy of that stature to be able to do that um, and care for other people, not just himself, is, speaks volumes. Um, but other guys like Sonny Gray has helped me tr tremendously the last two years. Just watching him go about his business, it's been really fun to learn from him. Um, so kind of kind of just taking stuff from everyone that's passed through here and guys that are still here. We always try to talk about the ball and talk shop and try to see what each other is thinking and see if they have any cool thoughts that we could pass along to each other. Well, let's finish with this. Is there ever a day that goes by when you're around other people that you don't get a comment about your height? Because obviously baseball players are tall, but you're up there, dude. You're, you're <laughs> six, eight or six, nine. You know, there's there's only a few guys that are. Richie at your level <laughs> usually usually it's when i first show up to camp everyone's like did you get taller um, <laughs> like when i'm out and when i'm out and about with my family like a, a random person will comment on it or say like, how, how tall are you something like that but when i'm around the guys every day they, they kind of get used to it i guess okay that's good i like it well <laughs> how, how are you on planes if, if you got to go to on vacation with the wife and kids you can't get a first class seat exit row is gone what happens next i'm in trouble yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah it's a very very uncomfortable seat for the next couple hours and I, i'd be the guy that goes excuse me i'm gonna lean back a little bit too <laughs> oh my goodness you get <laughs> that, would be tough. that would be and tough and i'm just <laughs> you're just me in the back of your chair the whole time that's it. That's it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Bailey, great to catch up with you, man. Appreciate the time. Enjoy the rest of camp and uh, good luck this season. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Cheers. Bailey over with us on FT. That was fun. Happy New Year. Happy he's New a smart Year. dude. <laughs> he's very he is. He's a, he's a very smart dude. He Yo, gets it. He, I felt smarter 
but I'm not as smart as him, of course. But the way he was talking, I'm like, yeah, I could talk like that. And then <laughs> I, I get what I, you're saying. I, yeah. <laughs> he, he's a fun dude to watch on the mound, too, because he's tall and crats. You can probably break down, you know, the uniqueness of what he brings with the arm slot and the height. And, you know, you're watching him and you're looking at the radar gun and he's not popping it like some of the other guys, but you're seeing swings and misses, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of swings and misses. And and I, I don't want to bore Todd with analytics, but <laughs> when you talk about max velocity of 93.8, that's his hardest pitch that he threw to a lefty. He hit 94 against a righty. So you're thinking, okay, he's in the lower 25th percentile. But you know where he gets his spin, spin rate. It's kind of mid, 2,500 spin rate. His extension is one of the farthest extensions yes. in all of baseball, which gives him, this will really bore Todd, a minus 9.4 perceived velocity. Essentially, he's one of the top 3% velocities at the plate when you're swinging the bat. Wow. Like you're talking like, you're talking like guys like Chapman. You're talking guys like Hater. That's what this 94 looks like out of his hand. Wow. Bo, it's a release point. I was going to say that. But great call by you, Kratzy. Like when someone finishes, I think about DeGrom, same thing, bro. When he Tough. finishes, you know, normal guys here, you extend three or four feet. All of a sudden, instead of, 60.6 inches or feet, 60.6 feet, it turns into like 53. It's like unfair. So, yeah, it's that 93 gets on you like 98 to 100. Of course, I, I understand totally what you're saying because yep. those are the guys you're like, I got them today. Oh, this is oh. where I get my mortgage from today. And all of a sudden, over you're three, like, you're like, you got to be kidding me. And he's done it. And those guys, for me, those guys, I loved hitting the heater. It would take me a few at bats. You know, yeah. I'm like, okay, 0 for 3. Ooh, I'm going to face him the next time. He's done a great job. He's striking out one. He's striking out a guy in inning. He's striking out nine per game right now. And he's got a career 3 6 ERA. Like, this, he's very underrated. He plays. He also plays in my, make sure he's off right now. He plays in my K props for life. I love him. <laughs> he's off. Because his team would strike out a ton and he would strike out a bunch of dudes. So I could always count on whoever's facing him to get some strikeouts above their average, and then I'll just get my Bailey over five. Over it. Appreciate you. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I'm going to take the Bailey over. Uh -huh. mm, Thank you, Todd. Mm, mm. That, might be, that might be a seg segue segment every <laughs> five days. How you doing? Oh, yeah. Well, on that note, on that note, while we're into it, and before we get to uh, the Braves – uh, front office leader, the president of baseball ops, Alex Anthopoulos. Let's do our uh, BetMGM futures picks for the day. Today we're doing home run leaders and RBI leaders. Mm. We're starting with RBIs. It's just one human that you get to pick. Who is going to lead baseball in RBIs this season? Here's how the current list looks. Jordan Alvarez leading the way at plus, plus 650. And then you've got Soto, Judge, Alonzo, and Riley. Kratz, you want to start? Can I split my hundred dollars up to fifty and fifty? <coughs> Excuse me. Bless Bless you. You. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I get. Yeah, you you don't have to. I mean, you just tell me what you're thinking here. Sure. My thinking is Jordan Alvarez because I may go back to back years picking him as the MVP. This team, get dudes will get on, and he knows not only how to hit the ball out of the ballpark, but he knows how to. Kind of be that Albert Pujols, that Carlos Lee, the guys that know how to get 100 RBIs because they're okay putting the ball in play. He hits 300. Like to me, that's one of that's one of the favorites on any of these lists that I love. But I also think Austin Riley might have a year where he he puts out 140 stakes because he's going to be cleaning up anything that Matt Olson doesn't put out there, and they're just going to be on base a ton. So. If if I'm gonna go 70 30 here, I'm gonna go Jordan for 70 bucks and I'm gonna take Austin Riley at my plus 900. I think the obvious answer, which nobody's seeing, is Jose Abreu. <laughs> 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 that was Dude, my guy all last year. Come oh, back. We got, we got home runs coming up next. It's okay. That's hey, true. Listen, home runs is listen, your spot. 
And for people who don't know, I picked him to be all king almighty, and it didn't work out. He had an okay year, but it took him a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the obvious answer is Aaron Judge. I mean, that's the obvious answer. But I'm going to go nope. across town to New York and pick Pete Alonzo. This is a big year for him. I feel like he's just going to keep doing what he does. And I feel him 50-plus homers this year, too, as well. You're kind of kind of inklinging. Ink- linking where i'm contract going contract year baby yeah I, i'm going pete alonzo plus 900 but the obvious answer is aaron judge but we'll see what happens yeah if judge is healthy that that's my pick here's where i'm massively struggling massively struggling mm. how is juan soto second mm. second i'd say that he has the second highest chance of finishing <coughs> as the rbi leader as the two-hole guy who knows how to work a walk for the Yankees? Somebody yes. Has an answer. Yes, you. Because they don't think Aaron Judge is going to be able to drive. Like, I don't get that either. What is, like, do they not hear second. what Aaron Boone said? They don't listen to FT. He's going to hit second over, over Aaron Judge. If Aaron Judge was hitting second, I would be like, ah, Juan Soto might hit 120 RBI. Yeah, and who's he's leading not. off for the Yankees? We don't know yet. Who's the lead off? Let me. For maybe. sure. I mean, if he's yeah, yeah, it's me. Okay. Well, okay. So DJ's on. He's not the fastest guy. No, but they DJ don't... gets on. I mean, he could, DJ if he if he bounces back a little, he could be a thirty three to thirty six percent on base guy. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Soto is a what forty five percent on base guy. I mean, I don't know what I'm missing here for him to be ranked that high. I think Soto has a chance to an MVP, but he's going to score runs. He's going to obviously knock in runs, but leading the league, that's where I have a hard time. Like, I mean, Soto was a 410 OBP last year, and he had 109 RBIs. But this year, he's hitting second with with Judgey up next. If that pitch is close, you're taking it, mm. right? And Judgey comes up and bops everyone home. So I think if Aaron's healthy, that's my pick. Maybe they're saying maybe they're saying he won't walk as much because that's my that's my gripe against what Todd said about Judgey being the clear favorite. Who protects him? I, I need to. I need Anthony Rizzo to beat me before Aaron Judge beats me. But I, if I'm throwing to Soto, I can't let Soto on for free because then Aaron Judge, a Aaron, can drive Todd in from his house. Like he doesn't need to be running bases. Like so, to me, maybe they're maybe they're, that plus eight hundred is because they think he has the world's greatest protection. Mm-hmm. I think they're wrong. I mean, they're giving way too much credit to every pitcher in baseball having the command to even do that, right? Like, you're, you're still treating Juan Soto carefully, you know? Otherwise, yes, you're getting smashed. Like, that strategy won't work for a while, and, and guys are going to miss. And when you miss outside the zone, Juan Soto ain't swinging. So let's go to home run picks quick here. We got Judgey leading at plus 375. Then it's a pretty big drop-off. It goes to Olsen, Schwarber. Alonzo and Otani. I'll go first. I got Otani for plus 900. I mean, same thing. I put the caveat in there. If the health is there for the entire season, the dude just focusing on hitting in a ridiculous lineup is a slam dunk for me. I think he's going to go off. He's going to want to have a put on a freaking show. He's going to want to be in the lineup every day. That is definitely attainable given that he won't be on the mound at all this year. He's not going to be in the field. He's just an everyday DH, and I could see him bopping, you know, 58 home runs this year. Sure. Sure, I agree with that. I'm sticking with Pete Alonzo and Polar Bear Mm. contract year. I I know where Kratz likes that, but he's going to have to pick a different one. No, you can pick the same. But, (laughs) yeah, I I, I just think his swing plays, man. The way he swings and attacks the ball uh, in a fashion where – that ball did something to him when it never does nothing to you, and he just mashes. So I'm going with Polar Bear Pete Alonzo with 53 homers. I like it. As long as we don't do this again, as long as we don't pick home run leaders again, like tomorrow, because I waffle yeah. back and forth. Yeah, I so need, well. like, I think Otani the one day, and I think Pete the next day. I think Pete's free agent year and his his ability, what sticks out in my mind is Todd's story about him hitting one hand home runs in BP. Like you're talking about another level power, but you're also talking about Otani. Like we've never seen Otani. 
in a lineup that has ridiculous protection and only hitting. He is not using any energy. I don't know if it's going to, you know, go over to more home runs. So that's why I'm leaning towards Pete in this one. But it could be Otani winning, you know, winning MVP. Otani doing stealing bases. I don't want Otani an MVP, but like, what are his legs going to give him at the plate <laughs> that they're not giving him when he was pitching? We shall see. Um, hey, first off, if you're in North Carolina, you can sign up for BetMGM Sports during the pre-registration period, and you'll receive $200 in bonus bets on the first day that BetMGM Sports goes live in North Carolina. And for everyone, you can place your first BetMGM Sportsbook wager through the app of at least five bucks. You'll get $150 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. That's once you place a bet, if you have a new account and you place a wager in the amount of at least five bucks at standard odds price, it's $150 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your wager. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING. All right, so we're going to have a big finish on a Friday. I like it. We are going to talk to the president of baseball operations for the Atlanta Braves. Oh, he's ready to go already right now. Let's bring in Alex Anthopoulos right now, first time on the show. Alex, great to have you on, man. And I'm going to say this. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of camp. Congratulations on the extension. The man who hands out the extensions gets one himself. How you doing? Great, great. Uh, Kratzy deserves all the credit. He stayed on it, man, just like his career. He was relentless. I kept trying to, like... Hand check him, give him the give him the Heisman to come off, and he stayed. To stay with so I apologize that uh, couldn't come on sooner. Yeah, no doubt, that's totally fine. You know, I'm going to keep pestering you now that I, you know, now that I've pestered you once, I'm going to keep pestering you. But your hair is looking, your hair is looking tremendous. I mean, I don't know if it's the light, I don't know if it's the time yeah, down in the funny. ER, the extension. I was on a Zoom call and Mike Hazen was on it, and he said your hair and beard are electric. Electric. I love that. It's like, yeah, I got to lower it. It's a little high. No, you do not. Don't change a thing. Do not change a thing. I thought when I you, still have it. you what? I'm going to enjoy it while I still have it. That's no, you're, you're past the point. You're past the point. You're, you're keeping that. It's just turning gray. That's the beauty. I don't have any gray hairs. Got a lot I of have, white. A lot of white. I have no out. gray hairs. Man, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> not one. And you know what? We're just going to go right to it. All right. All right you gave it. me this. I was not bald until you traded for me. Okay. And then I went bald. Well, you know, the b big regret for me was we had you in the minor leagues in Toronto and the coaches loved you. Game caller, gamer, this, we had all these other prospects and I'm not blowing smoke here, but you know, it kind of, it was eye opening to me. And then I look back in the past is that like, the guys that are around the players all the time are with them day in and day out, especially at that position. You should listen to them probably more than the others, you know, because they knew what you brought, especially at that position. So it was like, you know, you left as a minor league free agent. And I'm like, man, like that should not happen. You know, this guy's become a productive player. Like we had him, he was ours. And when we had a chance to get you back, it was a way to right or wrong in my mind, you know? So let me take you to, and this story I haven't told on this show. Do you remember – when you fired me yes. at the end of spring training, two days before the beginning of the season. Do you remember that conversation in the little, probably the office that was twice as small as the one you're in right now? Was It, it was Gibby and me in the office, right? Gibby, you, <coughs> and, and D. Hale, DeMarlo Hale. Yes, I didn't, I didn't remember that DeMarlo was in there. Yes. Yep. And yep. so basically, AA fired me. He traded for me, and then he sent me to the bushes. They traded for me to pick up, uh, to catch Dickey, to catch the knuckleball. I never actually ended up catching the knuckleball, but he <laughs> traded for me, and then he sent me to the bushes, and I said, why did you even trade for me? What was the point? So from that point on, how are you a different general manager now or baseball head of baseball operations from that point in two, 10 years ago? Oh man, it is like, you know, I even said this, my last year in Toronto, 2015, uh, my, you know, at the end of the year, every GM has to do their end of season media wrap up, right? And obviously you're hoping that you're, you won the world series, but normally, you don't win the world series and you have to explain what went wrong and 
you know, what you have to fix and what you're going to do in the off season and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I remember, um, talking about it. I wish I could find a clip of it. My end of season wrap up. My last one is as, as the Blue Jays GM. I felt, I said, I think I felt like I'm finally hitting my stride as a GM. I'm, I'm finally starting to get it. Look, that was after my sixth season, right? So, um, five years to make playoffs six, but it's, it finally clicked to me in terms of makeup, putting a team together rather than just collecting talent, um, doing it a certain way. Like it's probably like a look. I don't know what it's. I'll never know what it's like to have, to have played, but probably like a guy who finds his swing or finds his, his delivery and ability to throw strikes. And you're like, man, I I kind of got it. Not that you're not going to make mistakes, but I felt like I finally made some adjustments, and you know, a big part of it was just growing pains and failing like a ton of failure. And I'm lucky when I look back, I'm like, man, they really stuck with me. Um, I failed a lot. I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but I just, and again, I'm still going to make some, I still have, but I really felt like it took me those years to get it going. I felt like, man, I, I feel like I'm starting to get the hang of this thing. Um, so I can go on for hours. Um, and then for me, it would be going back to examples. I can list every year. I would have done this differently, that differently. And it wasn't that you're going to make get make mistakes on signing guys or trading for guys, but just little things that I would have done, you know, communicating this and that, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and I haven't changed since and I'm scared to go back. Cause I, the other way was we didn't win and I've kind of stuck with it. I felt that 2015 season, I stuck with it and I haven't changed from that point. And, you know, so far still having some success. Picking up a guy like Chris Sale, man. I played with him at, with the White Sox for uh, about a year and a half. Awesome guy, awesome individual. We know there's risk involved with him, with the injuries and everything else. Talk a little about uh, the process going into picking him up and uh, what do you think he brings to the table this year for your squad? Yeah, so like Kratzy was talking about, I think the biggest thing that – I've told this story many times before. So 2013 Toronto, tons of hype. Vegas has us win in the World Series, make that monster trade with Miami, get all, all these guys. And um, I remember we picked up Henry Blanco and Mark DeRosa. Considered two elite clubhouse guys, gamers, all the above, everything you want, right? And at the time, not having played, not having been around clubhouses, I've just figured, okay, it's like having in ingredients to a meal, you know? You know, I got to check the box and get a clubhouse guy or two, and I'm good. I, I got that part of the team set. And... You know, talking to guys like DeRosa that year about makeup and clubhouse and how guys fit together in chemistry, he was telling me all this stuff, and I heard it, but I didn't get it. Now, I didn't realize I didn't get it. I thought I got it, but I didn't, I didn't get it. So fast forward to 2015, really 2014 offseason, you know, another one of your former teammates, I don't know if he was still there. I assume he's still there if Sale was there, Mark Burley. I had a conversation with him. I was like, I'm done. I'm sick of this. Like, I'm not doing it this way anymore. Like, I'm cleaning house. And started making some moves, bring in Martin as a free agent, Donaldson, trade for Marco Estrada, uh, make a bunch of moves, uh, bring in Travis, second base. I remember him sending me a text. He's like, man, you were not kidding. You know, and I've become maybe to a fault at times because I still question myself is I'm so much about the person now, you know, and I remember like Pat Gillick, uh, telling me, and he said it in media interviews as well, and I didn't grow up in Toronto, but I grew up in Canada, and being the Blue Jays GM, you're obviously very uh, aware of Pat Gillick's accomplishments, but he talked about when he started, and he had a scouting background, and I've had a scouting background, so I've always looked at it through a scouting lens, tools, this, that, all the time, and he was 70% talent, 30% makeup character, and then over time, it was 60-40, um, and I got to tell you, I feel like I've gone to like 55 45 talent makeup character so on sale love the ability like we're not going to engage if we don't think a guy can help us and help us win games and so on but then you start doing work on the person on the teammate on the guy man was it powerful like wow you want to get him awesome teammate accountable you watch some of his interviews no excuses people say they're great competitors but sometimes it's talk i mean this is as genuine as authentic a competitor in the little time i've been around him so I'm a big believer, especially being a parent now, um, you know, players make others better. I've seen it. it. took a while to see it, but I see it. You know, a coach can only do so much. A manager can only do so much. But peers can really impact. I think about it with my kids. Who they're around is an impact as well. So Chris Sale, for what he can do on the field between the lines, that's absolutely the majority of this. 
but who he is as a person, as a teammate, that's going to make Max Fried better. That's going to make Spencer Strider better. That's going to make Ian Anderson better. That's going to make all of our young guys better. He's not going to go give speeches or be anybody else other than he is. But you fill a clubhouse instead of having two guys like a Blanco and a DeRosa, I've kind of flipped that I'm like, you better have like 24 or 25 and maybe one or two that are on the border of pass fail to me. Can I stand up and just clap like this? <laughs> that's music to I love, you. I love that long-winded answer because oh, that is 100% what I try to tell kids as they're, you know, I'm coaching them in high school as the way that I hope people saw me in my career. So I love, I love everything you said there. Now, does all this come into extensions too? Because yeah. I think we need, I think we need a, Ronald Acuna extension because I don't know if you were in the Blue Jays system. I played with his dad when when we were in the Blue Jays together, but maybe maybe you weren't there yet. That was like 2005, 2006. Yeah, I joined. So I joined the Blue Jays as a scouting coordinator uh, December of 2003. And then I got okay. assistant okay. job in 2006. But yeah, look, extensions, big part of it. So I could tell you early on in my career, it was just, hey, value. If the value's there, Sure, let's do a deal. And again, I believe it doesn't mean I'm right. I don't have a ton of World Series rings. So, like, I'm definitely not the authority on this. I'm just my own take and how I want to live my life, I guess, or quality of life. Um, I just, you know, to me, we don't, you know, we don't give out no trade clauses and so on. But I do think once you extend a guy, it's understood that, hey, they're extending because this, <coughs> this is where they want to be. And they've chosen to be here. So, we feel like if we extend you, we're ultimately making a commitment that you're you're going to be here. And I also think if we extend the wrong guy, I'm not saying ability wise, like guy doesn't go about it the right way and so on. You're sending a message to everybody else like this is what we value and this is cool and this is acceptable. So um, and look, the, the other part of it is you can't extend 26 guys just from a payroll standpoint, it won't work. But um, I was less discerning I guess early on in my career and it was more about hey you know this makes sense it's the right value let's let's do it and now I'm more specific to the person the the player and look that doesn't mean you're going to get them all done right we have I think we have like 26 really good guys right right now so um yeah in theory you want to keep all of them but it just doesn't work that way um but yeah I, I would say that it's uh I think the betting on the human betting on the person at the end of the day like Guys are going to get hurt. Guys are going to have bad years. That happens. You really kick yourself if you're like, I knew this guy didn't work hard. I knew he didn't take care of himself. I knew he wasn't a good teammate. And you knew it and you looked the other way because he was so talented. Those are the ones that you regret. Guy gets hurt. Guy doesn't perform. You know, he wants to. Uh, that happens. You just have to accept it. Hey, Alex, I know there was a little bit of an injury scare with Ronald. Seems like he's doing okay. My, my question's more big picture. I mean, how do you make sure that he is 100% come playoff time? And I guess this goes for everyone, right? But Ronald's such an aggressive ball player. I know he's, you're not going to suddenly be like, hey, let's, let's you know, steal a few less bases just in case. You can't do that when a guy's in his prime, right? You want yeah, to say it, right? It. Yeah, I mean, look, it's awesome, right? 70, 40, bag, 40 homers, 70 stolen bases. In my job, you worry stolen bases, right? You get a finger, a hand, a wrist. But that's the way he plays. That's who he is. This guy loves baseball. I mean, forget that he's MVP and so on. He adores baseball. You'll see stuff on the internet online in the winter he's playing, whether it's in leagues or in parks. He loves the game. And that's how he plays. That's the energy he, he plays with and so on. And that's part of the game. Um, look, like you said, there was a scare. But you're going to have that regardless, right? You get hit by a pitch. You run down to first. Uh, you could drive yourself crazy worrying about this kind of stuff. So um, we trust him. He knows what he has at stake. And um, we, we trust him to be smart about it. And uh, we're just glad we were able to dodge a bullet at this point. I want to ask about uh, Freed a little bit. Uh, has there any been contract extensions about him coming up, about him maybe being a Brave for the rest of his life? Yeah, so – we have in his policy for obvious reasons we've never gotten into if we've tried to sign guys or whatnot this and that i have said this on radio so there was an article around the winter meetings justin toscano really good writer at the uh, atlanta journal constitution newspaper wrote something about talks um 
I'm not quoted in there. I didn't talk to him about that. So, um, but I do think I should give credit where credit is due. He did a nice job doing the work there. I think the short answer without directly giving you an answer is he's really good. Second in Cy Young in 2022. One of the best left tennis starters in the game. We're better with Max Fried. No doubt about it. He likes it here. He wants to stay here. Um, we want to keep him? Sure. We got to find a way to do it where we can still have a good team around him. So um, the goal is going to be to keep him. Uh, the better you are, the harder it is. It goes without saying. And um, But, you know, I do know, like, all things being equal, he likes being here. So um, the goal is, though, we got to keep a competitive team one way or the other. So uh, without me coming out and saying it, there was an article that, Guy did a pretty good job at the winter meetings <clears throat> talking about last spring, some conversations. Um, but Max knows where we, we stand. Um, I love the way he – they asked him the question at our Fan Fest. I thought, as you'd expect, he's a total pro. Great guy. Um, and, look, he, he's awesome. So we have him for 2024. Hopefully beyond that, no way to be able to say anything more than that. Well, let me piggyback a little bit off of what I was going to say as well. Like, how comfortable are you talking about contract extensions once the season starts? Are you a guy that says, you know what, doesn't matter what time or place it is, if we can get a guy that we really want, let's go get him while the season starts. You know how some players are, I'm done after spring training, blah, 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 but money does talk, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Look, so I think that's a player-specific thing. I don't have to go out there and play, right? I don't have to – I get to watch in a radio booth or suite or whatever it is. So – um if I think cause we have a good team, we have a chance to get to the postseason and so on. Uh, if I think that it's going to affect their performance on the field, I don't care what the contract is. Like we're not going to sink our chances in the current season to have any conversations. But I think that's up to the player, right? If the player or his his representation feels like, hey, this is not good. Person's not going to be in a good space. It's going to affect their performance. We won't do it. So I'll let the agent or the player just decide those things. Um, some guys, like you said, are totally fine. Hey, I'm good. I'm not, it's not going to affect my performance on the field. We've had conversations in, in season. Um, sometimes the all-star breaks kind of that little pause period where you have, you know, three, four days, you can have some conversations there. So, and like you said, some guys are like, Hey, I want a deadline opening day. And then from there, I just want to worry about playing and that's fine too. So to me, it's a player's choice. Uh, we're going to re respect what they want to do. Uh, but I've kind of seen it all. I've seen guys go all directions on that kind of stuff. Winter ball. You mentioned it with Acuna. How nervous were you when he called you? I'm sure it wasn't just a, oh, yeah, that's cool, bro. Like, I know you played last year and you won MVP. How nervous does that make you? And do you as an organization set limits on that? And how, like, how is that handled by you? Right. So I remember, uh, it must have been two or three years ago, he f FaceTimed me. I think he'd just coming off the knee, begging to play, you know, like, please, I want to play, you know, and because he loves playing it. And, and I get it, right? His family doesn't get to see him play all the time and so on. But he was coming off an ACL. And, and so that was one where I'm going to the trainers and the doctors. And if they're, they're concerned, you know, we're not going to do it. And ultimately, if he was further removed, it would be fine. I will say this, generally speaking, position player wise, I'm for it. I'm for it. I think it's a good thing. And part of it is I remember I was an assistant GM at the time. We had we had Marco Scudero in Toronto. He played in the winter all the time. And he was a really good player for us. And look, if you pitch and you want to go throw there, I'm definitely more apprehensive there. For position players, I'm all for it now with Ronald. So we actually, surprisingly, he played last year, went to the classic, had the best year of his career. I'm like, it worked. I'm not going to overthink this thing. So you just had the best year of your career. You played winter ball. You got off to a great start. You played in the classic. Go ahead. He knows what he has at stake. I'm fine with it. Now, at some point, we get to the end. They're playing in the Caribbean series and so on. And, you know, that was like a week away from camp. It's like, okay, you probably got enough work in. You got to get ready for spring training, and we'll, we'll kind of shut it down there. But for, for position players, I think it's a good thing. I think it happened way back when, a lot more than it does now. You know, guys wanted to make some money back then as well. Um, if you pitch, uh, that I'm not as big a fan of. Alex, question for you on off-season philosophy, because especially the last few off-seasons, you got a lot of work done early. You set very specific goals. It seems like you target specific players, not specific numbers, if that makes sense. It's a fact 
I know enough front office people that some of them will plug in numbers and say, this player is pretty much equal to this player. It seems like that is not your approach and an approach by a few other GMs that seem to be thriving. Do you feel like that's the case where you sit down in a meeting and you differentiate players and you don't put them in the same realm of, say, a war number or whatever the proprietary number is that you guys have? Does that, am I making sense? Yeah, no, I totally get what you're saying. So look, yeah, you can sit there and analytically say, okay, you've got X player for, you know, young guy for six years. And, you know, three of those years are assuming they're up, you know, they're going to make the minimum or somewhere in that range. And then I'll ultimately go through arbitration and so on. And you could, you know, try to calculate it and put values and so on. I just, we're not, this is again, speaking for myself. Um, not everyone's going to get six years of service and five years of service in order to be healthy or all this. So you can project what the potential upside is and the value and so on. Um, but look, I think you're right. I think, Generally speaking, you're going to have needs every offseason. You need a utility guy. (coughs) But we do try to make it player specific, right? So, you know, let's say you have a need and the players available just aren't that good. You're going to go commit yourself to four years or five years, uh, whether it's trading for someone with a long contract or signing someone, if that's not the player you want. Next offseason, now you're jammed up and you've locked in that position. So um, I think – we're so particular about who we bring in the person we do so much work on the makeup and what we think will fit in. And I think that's the biggest key to this is just who's going to be the best fit for this group and this city and this staff. And, you know, just like, you know, and that doesn't mean they're going to be the best fit in some other place. So it kind of makes it easier to go about it. Right. You just kind of, your, your pool of players becomes a little smaller. You, you really pay attention to the work on those guys and you ultimately try to get them done and you don't always get them done. You can't always trade for them. You can't always sign them, but you don't get caught up in this guy's really good player. Well, if you know, they're not a good fit or they're not going to go with, you know, they're not going to mesh with your hitting coaches or your bullpen coach or your manager and so on. Um, you know, I have to be mindful in my job and my, you know, that, it's easy. I'm not just dumping a bunch of guys on our, our staff, whether that's the clubhouse staff, the trainers, the coaches. And I don't have to live with them day in and day out, right? I want my boss, our control person is Terry McGurk. I wouldn't want him handing me a bunch of employees and being, all right, here's your AGM, here's your this, here's your that. So I think it's important that we take it all into consideration because, again, it's not collecting talent. It's building a team and how the pieces fit. And that took me a long time to grasp you know, and I'm not saying it can't be done another way. I tried doing it the other way. It didn't work for me. So that's my view on it. What a great transition by you. For me, from that to my question, what did you see? <laughs> you're, were you All the things that you said, now I'm going to plug in the name Jared Kelnick. What did you see in Jared Kelnick that made you make that move? And what do you foresee from him for this team? Yeah, look, he's obviously hasn't had the success that was projected of him, expected of him, and so on. So obviously, if he was an all-star right now, you have no chance of getting him, right? So you got to take shots. We have a lot of position players locked up, guys that are established, all-stars, and so on. Um, We're looking to get – we've had a revolving door in left field, and we've had good players there, Adam Duvall, Eddie Rosario, and so on, really good players, good clubhouse guys, so on. But this was an opportunity to get a young guy who's got a chance to be here for a while, left-handed bat that we wanted to have that can bounce out the lineup, who's a plus defender. He can throw, he can run, um, he can fill in in center field. And he's got big offensive upside, he's got big power and so on. And we felt like this would be a good spot for him because he's not coming in as the guy. He doesn't have to carry the load. He can hit at the bottom of the lineup, go play good defense. Whatever we get offensively from you will be great. It'll be all upside. And obviously the ceiling is huge, but he fits the roster, the balance that we're trying to – to have and it felt like hey look obviously there, there's risk like all these things but you know if it clicks he could be a core player for us yeah and we, we had him on about a month ago and i mean he's got that natural chip on his shoulder like he still has so much left to prove which is always a great thing and he's pumped to join this team so we're excited about it alex great to have you on here yes yeah, grad uh, you want to finish yeah I have, one, I have one more you said about acquiring talent so and i need you to tell me right now did you trade for me because you were acquiring talent <laughs> or was it because you thought I was really, really good person? 
Ooh, you got the bell in there too. Nice work. So <laughs> you the makeup was a plus because everyone raved about you in the minor leagues, right? All the coaches, they were like, we had a lot of depth back then too. So uh, that was definitely part of it. You were successful too. You would have, you, you know, so it's, you were a major league player and with good makeup and at a really important position to have good makeup. So and I had an option. And, and I had an option, and that's what you remember, you know. I don't remember those things, but you certainly do. But that's what you know, you're, a a and you're, you're getting fired. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's something that maybe in, in the grand scheme of things, it's all part of the experience, right? It's all part of the journey and learning, and like you know, look from that from the decision with you to a bunch of other decisions. Like, I look back and I'm like, man. I would change so much, right? You just can't. But as long as you take something from it and learn from it, then it's it's time well spent and you got something out of it. So I kind of obsess about, I look back a lot. I'm not into the, it's just baseball, it happens. I think you, you can pull something out of anything. So um, yeah, it's one of those things that whatever, 10 years later or whatever it is, I'm still sitting here, which is a shock to me as well. You know what I pulled out of it? <laughs> what? Two Two huge rings, so I appreciate that. One yeah. American League championship, one World Series ring. So beautiful. It worked out for all sides. Yes, it, it did. Was. And and he said, you know what? That guy's going to be a good broadcaster one day. A good a good host on a digital <laughs> yeah, exactly. show. So there <laughs> you go. Awesome. And Alex, <laughs> a, a, as you know, you're a great interview, man. I appreciate you know the transparency always. And thanks for hopping on with us. Good luck this season, dude. We'll try and catch you at some point. All right. All right, guys. See ya. Thank you. Appreciate you. Alex Anthopoulos running the Braves front office, doing a great job. And, you know, I've talked about this, but it's good to actually put it to our style of show. When you bring on someone like that who's leading a front office and you get those types of thoughtful, non-bot answers, that's what we need. Great for the game in every way. Runs the org well. Players love working with him. He's honest. He's a great interview. See, that, that's my thing. Like, I, I get on a rant about this, but Kratz, there is a way to conduct interviews to make our game engaging and entertaining. And yep. some of the GMs are great, and others need to watch that and take a page out of that book and not be a bot on every answer because it's not necessary. Like, you have the job. You can still speak, and people want to connect with you. And, he's, and he made himself connectable he made himself tangible yeah. and that's it he's you know what he his his faults were early on he said what he tries to do and he never says you know what i have all the answers he's like i'm still learning and he's trying you what i get out of that is he really cares about the people he's around and he cares about how each player each front office each staff member each clubhouse guy is treated and he understands that that's what builds success. But also, but ultimately, he understands baseball is not the end all be all. He just wants the best for those people, and that is what he was like. That when I was when he traded for me in Toronto, and you know, I joke about the fact that it didn't work out there. But I I do believe that my interaction with him and my little bit of time that I was in Toronto while he was the GM, I hope helped him you know, make better decisions for other guys down the line. Well said. Let's slap. It's a new year. It's a new slap. <laughs> new slap. I, I like you it. to see that. I like it. Fire. Um, first off, there's a couple questions from the chat that need to be <clears throat> answered. And then we'll do Kratz hats. Rob wants to know if you cashed the Donaldson check since it's hanging up there. Yes. <laughs> okay. That Good. was a, that was a, a copy. There it looks go. real though. Actually, so it's, I, it's I might have fired. to go back in the archives. <laughs> I really hope I did. Well, you can do it. I mean, the way I do the checks, you can do the digital where you snap the the pick so you don't have to hand it in or. Whatever. I doesn't do you know digital. What year? What year was this? Seventeen. Did what they was do? It? Yeah. Did they do it in seventeen? The digital checks. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I think you could do it yeah, back I then. I wouldn't know how to do that. But we'll, we'll look into it. Um, and then second of all, and I'll, I'll bring this to AJ on Monday. Jack in the chat said, not that I care, but AJ ought to dish, ditch the hat. He's got good hair. I'm jealous. So Fact. Did you guys realize Fact. that? AJ forgot to put his hat on today, and he has hair. 
I mean, a nice. collared shirt and and I want to know where he was going. And his hair was prim and proper. And he said no golf. So no golf for, our, for a resident non-hair expert. They're guess everybody's guessing on here what kind of hat he's got on. There's a lot of guesses here. Blue Jays, uh, the late 2000s. Um, Kratzy, what do you got, dude? I mean, think about it. We had Alex Anthopoulos on. We had JD on. Oh, it was. And it's a spring training hat. It's the oh, I mean, this was like a maybe a year and a half Blue Jay hat. It was it was not much, but I, I don't. I never liked. I don't this like John that either. That they mm -mm. had on the side because I love, the bottom. Uh, I love how it's a stretchy hat. It's great, but what do you guys think about the T? Like they the, really tried hard. Wait, let me ask you. What is the? Is that a? That's that hat's a D for me, man. I really don't like it. Um, what, and it, those those sides alone take me down a grade for, or two. Though? Terrible. What's the T for? Uh, it's Blue Jays. Terrible. What? It's the Blue Jays. Toronto. Oh, dude, I couldn't yeah. put two and two together. Ricky T. I thought it was supposed to be a J for the Jays. Oh, I called no. me crazy. I'm Toronto, I'm but dude, it. that the the sides there either look like you know they're yeah. plugged into your brain, or look, for some reason for me, like I picture you know like a a dad on a vacation in yeah, Florida yeah, going yeah, for yeah. a jog around Fishing the neighborhood, and he's got like the double stroller, oh. and he's like, "Hey guys, I the don't know." The brim it's is just, lower it's not than working. the cap, it's, uh, and it's the tough. shorts Deep. and the shorts are like Deep. this short too. It looks like a running hat to yeah. me. They got you wear that hat with bike shorts on. Remember the bike shorts? I coach with bike shorts on. Yes. Oh, stop it! No, don't tell me that. Re ready for this, FT fam? <laughs> We're at Astros camp on Monday. We're at Twins camp <laughs> next week on Thursday. And a new addition to the roster to the FT fam is oh. joining us on Tuesday. I will give you one hint. Oh. It is our first pitcher joining the roster. Oh. We now have arms. Losers. We, are, we are buying innings, okay? No one else is, but we will. Right or left. Maybe I'll give you that hint this weekend. See you Monday. I saw that crap. Maybe you give us a hint.